Hey, it's Ryan, and today I'm out here on Mille Lacs doing one of my favorite things, and that is sight fishing for gator-sized northern pike on first ice through spear holes. And the reason I like this so much is I can throw them back. If I get a big northern, I can toss that fish back. It's a lot of fun. They come right up to your feet, grab your minnow, and take off. They give you a heck of a fight. It's just one thing that I look forward to on first ice and it peaks right now. Each species kind of has its best time of year to be fishing for it. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna be talking about peak seasons during the ice fishing season on Mille Lacs Lake. I'm gonna be going through what species are at their best during these seasons, what type of techniques I'm using to catch them, and what locations I'm going through, as well as I'm also going to define the seasons. So by the end of this, you're gonna know when the best time is for each of these species, what you need to be using, and where you should be looking for. Now these are gonna be kind of broad outlines. I'm not gonna get overly specific about the techniques and the locations, but I'm gonna give you a very good starting point. So you'll be able to come up here at any point throughout the ice season and be able to get out and have a good starting point, a good launch pad for finding fish during each one of these seasons. Have fish. Take a look at that pig. Oh, 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 oh. I think the best place to start is by defining what the seasons are. When I think of Mille Lacs Lake ice fishing, I think of four main seasons. And the first of which is first ice, and then you have early ice, next would be midwinter, and then lastly is going to be late ice. And breaking those down into how I define each of them is first ice is going to be kind of a November thing. That's when you're walking out. It's usually right around Thanksgiving. It's the smallest window of opportunity. It's usually isolated bays is where most of the first ice fishing is going to be taking place. Soon after first ice, comes early ice and that's more of a December thing. Now that can vary a little bit from season to season but by definitely by mid-December you're talking early ice and that's when things are much more accessible. Guys are getting out on wheelers, snowmobiles, side-by-sides. They're making their way out of the bays and they're going out into the main lake. They're getting out to those rock piles, gravel bars, mud flats. They're kind of getting to go where they want out there. That's early ice. That's to me is a December thing. Next would be midwinter, and this is arguably the longest season, and that's going to be a January and February deal. When you're talking vehicle traffic making its way out into the main lake, you got trucks and fish houses and everything that goes with them, all that commotion making its way offshore, that's definitely midwinter, that is January and February. Something you always need to keep in mind on Mille Lacs, especially midwinter, is the effect that pressure has on fishing. So when it comes to midwinter, make sure that you're not in the middle of the pack. Some lakes, you know, especially smaller lakes, you'll find that you need to be in the group of people. There's small schools of fish, the fish houses are piled up, you know, sometimes around aerators, sometimes around deep pockets, whatever it may be. But if you're not on that spot, you're not catching fish. Mille Lacs is totally different. If you are on that spot where everybody is hanging out, if you're on that reef and there's a bunch of fish houses that have been there for a week, you need to just move on because the commotion and all that pressure on top of those fish is just gonna push them away. There's 132,000 acres of lake here. Those fish don't need to be on any one spot. There are thousands of reefs. There's hundreds of mud flats and mud flat areas for them out there. There's tons of gravel bars. They don't need to sit around in an area and get pounded on. So what I always recommend to people is leapfrog the pressure. If you see a lot of fish houses in one spot, don't go into the middle of the pack. You gotta separate yourself, find something. It doesn't have to be on the other side of the lake, but it just has to be a little bit of ways from all that commotion and all that pressure. Lastly is going to be late ice. And late ice is after walleye season. Late ice is um, a March and April thing out here. Now, what I will say is late ice is a little less defined. Uh, some people may consider late ice to be when the ice is receding from the shoreline. Other people may say it's anything after walleye season. 
What I see is the definition between midwinter and late ice is mushier than at other times during the season. And that's because it kind of depends what the weather does. Even though I think of late ice as definitely a March and April thing, what I really think kicks off the best late ice fishing is a good thaw that really knocks down a lot of the snow. Sometimes you'll see that like the third week of February, you'll get a warm day, a lot of the snow gets knocked down. It allows a lot more light penetration into the lake. Sometimes you just don't get that until right at the very end. It could be mid-March or even later than that. But um, that's late ice. I'm just gonna define it as a March and April thing. For the fish, their internal clock is definitely a March and April thing. But when you see that good thaw late February into March, that's definitely what's really gonna spur a lot of late ice activity. Now to go through each season, we're gonna start with first ice right at the beginning. It's typically gonna be right around Thanksgiving. One of my favorite things to do at this time and one of the most exciting ways to ice fish is fishing through spear holes. Doing the sight fishing thing is an absolute gas. If you've never done it before, I highly recommend it. Get out on first ice, you gotta walk out there, you gotta cut a spear hole. Um, you can do it with a, a few different things. I used to do it with a chisel, I would chop a hole. Once you start getting up to eight, 10 inches of ice, it becomes a ton of work to cut a hole that way. So I ended up buying an ice saw that's really efficient. You can find good ones like uh, the wood handle blue ice saw. That's one of the best ones out there. They're about 150 bucks or so. Um, if you have a chainsaw, chainsaws work great. I recommend getting the oil out of it so you don't have a lot of oil around your hole. So dump the oil out of the chainsaw or the, the bar oil out so you don't have that to deal with. Some guys will replace the bar oil with vegetable oil. But um, either one of those saws or chisels will work. Cut a big hole in the ice. I always recommend finding the best weed line you can with the greenest cabbage. And if you can find it adjoining a hard bottom, that's going to be your best area to be. So what I tell people is to find green cabbage. Usually you're gonna find it around 10 feet of water in the bays and find where that break line adjoins up to a harder bottom, such as a point. When you look at a map, you'll be able to find a point. You'll be able to see that 10 feet of water adjoining up to that point. Those are really high percentage areas and they're gonna give you the best action throughout the day. They'll have morning, day, and evening action there. My favorite thing to do is just put down a big shiner minnow about a third of the way down the water column. So if I'm in 10 feet of water, I'm putting that shiner minnow about three feet down, just so it's over the weed top, so it's that green cabbage. The pike like to cruise around, they see that big minnow up there and they swim right up to your feet and grab it. It's uh, such a rush when they do it. It's one of the most fun things I do ice fishing. I look forward to it every year. The other opportunities are, since you're going for that apex predator, those big pikes, sometimes it can be a bit of time before bites. What I like to do is I like to fish for perch. And all you need for this is a little jig, a little tungsten jig, a gold tungsten is my favorite, a little four millimeter. Load it up with spikes, drop it down close to the bottom or halfway down the water column. Those perch typically aren't too picky and hammer away on them. A lot of times you're going to find the perch are small. They're mini perch. They're uh, not really worth anything, but they keep you busy. They kind of keep you entertained. If you stick with it, a lot of times you sort through a lot of fish, you'll be able to find some keepers throughout the day. You might get a meal of fish. If you get lucky, sometimes you get on, on quite a few big ones. That occasionally happens, but that's more of the exception than it is the rule. Now, if you're on just a weed line, you're gonna find the perch and pike. They cruise those weed lines. You're gonna find them no problem. But if you get on that weed line that adjoins up to a hard bottom like the point, what I will tell you is that's going to give you your best opportunity for an evening walleye bite. Now, the walleyes in the bays are not my first choice for getting on daytime walleyes, but there's definitely an evening rush when you're by a hard bottom. So when you set up, on that hard bottom, keep a minnow down, just a set line, plain hook and minnow, or uh, keep a jigging spoon. I really like flutter spoons, especially early in the season. They make a lot of flash. They draw fish in from a long ways away. 
keep those two things handy. You'll find that right at the end of the day when it gets too dark to really see much down the hole, that's when the walleyes start moving in. That's when you get that flurry of activity, that last hour of light. Next is early ice, and early ice is when you start being able to get out on the main lake. That's when you can get your wheelers and your snowmobiles and your side-by-sides, and you can start getting out to your rock areas, you can start getting out to your mud flats, and you can start getting out to your gravel bars. Generally, that's when you have a good eight inches or more of ice out on the main lake. Early ice provides the best walleye fishing opportunities of the entire season. And early ice will extend until you start getting truck and vehicle traffic and fish house traffic out into the main lake. So sometimes it could be over by the beginning of January. Sometimes it ex can extend a couple weeks into January. It just depends a little bit on the year. It's kind of a moving target each year. On a warmer year, it'll last a little bit longer. On a cooler year, it might be a little bit shorter. But either way, that's going to be your best walleye fishing opportunity of the season and we have some really great bites on early ice. There's a couple different techniques that I really gravitate to when fishing walleyes on early ice. The first of which is going to be the flutter spoon. I really like flutter spoons early in the season. Walleyes early on are typically really aggressive. A flutter spoon gives off a lot of flash, a lot of vibration, and it really draws fish in from a long ways away. I love the flutter spoons early on, especially up shallow. Generally, those shallow fish are very aggressive early in the season. It's just kind of the best of all worlds. Tip it with a minnow head, jig it pretty aggressively. When they come in, you can continue jigging it aggressively. Sometimes they'll clobber it. Other times you'll find that you need to tone it down a little bit. But either way, kind of just uh, fit your presentation to whatever their mood is that particular day. The second thing that I like to use is just a set line. And I always have a set line down for walleyes. Anytime I'm walleye fishing, there will be a set line down. A lot of days you'll find that it outproduces the jigging 10 to 1. Like it's just not even close. They want something on a set line. They want it sitting still. Um, sometimes the jigging spoon will outproduce the set line. But either way, I always have a plain hook and minnow down or a jig and minnow down on a set line. Now that can be a tip up. It can be a rod holder style tip up. It can be a rattle reel. It could just simply be a bobber and a rod sitting next to where you're jigging. Whatever it is, early in the season, I just prefer to use a plain hook and kind of a medium size or a smaller minnow. A big fat head, a big rainbow, or a small shiner, like a three to four inch shiner. Those are perfect on the set line. I like to set them up about a foot and a half to two feet off of the bottom and just leave them there. A lot of times you'll find that's where you get your best fishing is on the set lines, chasing flags on tip ups or else just hitting the bobber that's sitting next to where you're jigging. Early ice, your locations can vary. You can be on shallower rock piles, you can be on deeper rocks, you can be on points, you can go out to the gravel bars, you can go out to the mud flats. You're gonna find that the fishing is really great on all of them. One of my favorite places to go to first though is the gravel bars. And something I like about the gravel bars is when you're one of the first people out to the gravel bars, there tends to be a lot of fish on them. They seem somewhat susceptible to, uh, to uh, the gravel bars seem somewhat more susceptible to pressure than other areas. Obviously shallow rocks, you know, you'll blow fish out of there right away with pressure such as truck, four wheeler, people driving around, drilling holes, whatever they're doing. Shallow rocks can't handle a lot of that. But gravel bars are popular and they get a lot of traffic out to them right away. So what I like to do is, if I can be, I like to be one of the first guys out to the gravel bars. You'll find that there's a lot of fish stacked up on them. They produce fish throughout the day. They're relatively easy to fish. What I like to do is just go right up to the top of the gravel bar, or if I know where there's a few scattered rocks on the gravel bar, I'll set up there. A lot of times you'll find that near the top. You can also fish points on the gravel bars where the points extend out into the muddy basin. But typically what I like to do is just set up right up on top. I like to put out a set line with a minnow and I like to put down my flutter spoon and jig aggressively with the flutter spoon because you can draw fish in from a long ways out on the gravel bars. Keep that set line out there. Some days you'll just hammer them on both. Some days they'll take one over the other. 
but either way, going out to the gravel bars is one of my favorites during the early ice period. Another one of my favorites during early ice is going to be the rock piles. Now, the rock piles are more hit or miss. Um, the gravel bars are always consistent if you're one of the first guys out to them. The rock piles are not always that way. You can have excellent opportunity on them, but you can also have slow days on the rocks. What I recommend doing is finding the spot on the spot on the rocks. Now, if you have an area on the rocks where you have a nice defined long drop off, fish will use that as a runway. So you can set right on the bottom side of that drop off. You can keep some rods up higher off of the bottom. So fish that may be on the reef can see your fish, your minnow hanging over the side, or you can keep your baits closer to the bottom like normal, only a foot and a half, two feet off of the bottom. But setting up on those drop-offs is going to put you on a natural runway where you can intersect fish. The best place, however, that I find on the rock piles is just finding the end of a point where a point really tapers out into the main lake. I like to find the ends of those points. If you can find an area with larger rock at the end of those long tapering points, that's what I see as being one of the best, most key spots on the rock piles. But either way, being on the edge of the pile or being out on the tip of the point, those are going to be real high percentage areas on the rocks. And the beauty of the rocks is they're typically close to shore. They're within a mile or so, so you don't need to drive all the way out to the middle of the lake to get to the gravel bars or all the way out to the middle of the lake to get to the mud flats. It's a short jaunt to get to the rock piles. But on early ice, keep it in mind whether you're on the rocks or whether you're on the gravel, once you start seeing a lot of traffic out there, once you start seeing a lot of commotion building up out there, those spots are really going to start tapering off very quickly. Next is midwinter. When you start getting into that January, February time frame, there's a couple new opportunities that come up. And the areas that I tend to focus most of my attention at this time is going to be the mud flats. And the Mille Lacs is just famous for its mud flats. That's what everybody knows the lake for. And the mud flats are just a big area, kind of that northwest quadrant of the lake. Uh, the mud flats rise up out of the basin. They're kind of unique to Mille Lacs Lake. Most people think of a mud flat, they're thinking of the basin. Mille Lacs actually has these little mud mesas out in the basin that come up a few feet off of the bottom and they're super attractive to fish. They've got a lot of bug life out there, it attracts a lot of bait, it attracts a lot of small fish, and in turn it attracts a lot of big predators. So the mud flats are something that I'm definitely fishing throughout midwinter. And the beauty of the mud flats is they're relatively close together, but they're different structures. So even if one mud flat starts to get a lot of activity on it, there's too much commotion, too much pressure, and the fishing slows down, a lot of times all you have to do is drive a mile, you go to the next mud flat, or drive a half mile, go to the other end of a mud flat, and you'll find that the fishing is once again great. So there's a lot of advantages to fishing the mud flats. They're pretty easy to fish. Overall, what I'd recommend is you can fish the tops, you can fish off the edge in the basin. But what I typically recommend people to do on the mud flats is pick a point, pick a certain area on the flat and really pick that area apart. The points on the flats are just general areas of isolation. The cool thing about a point is instead of picking one side of the flat or the other, you're kind of picking two sides at the same time by setting up on the end of a point. So set up on the end of the point. And what I generally do for the walleyes at this time is a little bit different than what I'm doing during early ice. So midwinter, my approach to the walleyes is extremely similar, but there's a couple key differences. By midwinter, January and February, what I'm doing is instead of using the flutter spoons like I like to use right away early on with all their action and uh, the way they attract fish fr from a distance, what I do once we get to midwinter is I'm typically going with something a little more subtle, so to speak. So instead of the flutter spoon, I'm going to be using a big slab style rattle spoon. There's a bunch of good ones on the market, but typically a quarter ounce or an eighth ounce slab style rattle spoon with a minnow head on it. It has a lot less action, a lot less fluttering. It's moving around a lot less. You can still jig them aggressive, but typically what I'm doing is just little pops, just snapping them up six inches to a foot and just going real steady with it. Now, some days you may find that when the fish come in on your Vexar or on your camera, you gotta go a little more subtle than that. You gotta do little one, two inch pops in order to 
tease them in and get them to bite. Some days you just wanna keep with the same cadence the entire time. But either way, you can adjust that depending on the day and depending on what the fish's moods are that day. The second thing is I still use a lot of plain hooks and minnows, but once you start getting towards midwinter, you'll find that sometimes you're better off with a jig than you are a plain hook. A lot of times these fish become lethargic, especially as you get into the real depths of winter. So when those fish become lethargic, typically what I'll do is I'll put on some sort of weighted jig instead of just a plain hook. That weighted jig, it keeps the minnow in place. It holds it right in front of that fish's nose. The minnow can't dart and swim away nearly as easily. And a lot of days you'll find that gets you a lot more bites than a simple plain hook. Now the second opportunity that's provided midwinter out on the flats is the perch fishing. This is where you start to really get into the nicer perch that Mille Lacs has to offer. Uh, there's a lot of those keeper size 9, 10, 11 inch perch out here, but you also occasionally get those 12, 13, 14 inch perch, those big jumbos, which are always really cool to catch. That really starts to take off midwinter out here. And it's definitely what I've seen the last few years. My best luck has been out on the mud flats doing the walleye fishing. What I typically recommend is while I fish the points, on those flats, work the structure, that area, put a tip up up on top or a set line up on top of the flat on that point. If you're looking for the perch, a lot of times you're gonna find them real close. They'll be off the deeper edge of the flat. So whereas you may be walleye fishing in 26, 28 feet of water, a lot of times some of the best perch fishing might be in 32, 34 feet of water, just a few steps away from there. For the perch, my setup is extremely simple. I just use a pretty heavy tungsten jig. When you're fishing that deep, a lot of times I go with a five millimeter tungsten jig. Uh, usually I'm going with one of two colors out here. I'm either going with gold, which is my favorite most days, or I'm going with glow in the dark. All I do to tip that jig is I just load it up with spikes. Uh, you can either use red or white. What I will recommend is if it's dark down the hole, Sometimes what I like to do is use the red spikes because they create a better profile and then set my camera up where the sunlight is behind my jig and that allows me to see better with the camera. So I'm not real worried about the color of the spikes as far as catching the fish. I'm more worried about the color of the spikes and their visibility, especially if I'm using an underwater camera. Key little tip for you on perch is flashers work excellent for catching perch, but if you really want the best edge perch fishing, an underwater camera, nothing beats it. And lastly is late ice. And late ice, like I said, it's not quite as defined as the other seasons because some of it's based on weather, some of it's based on just uh, the time of year and the fish's moods, but we'll just call it a March and April thing. Definitely once you have that initial thaw where you lose a lot of the snow on the lake and you start getting a lot more light penetration later in the winter, that's definitely going to be a good indicator of late ice. When I think of late ice, there's two species that I'm going for out here and that's going to be the perch and the tulipy. And the cool thing about late ice is you're gonna find the perch and the tulipy right next to each other oftentimes. And another neat thing about late ice is what you're using for perch typically works excellent for the tulipy as well. Now for the perch, I'm just gonna continue using that tungsten jig. The other thing I'll put down for perch is just a plain hook and a minnow. Uh, a lot of days you'll find that sometimes the biggest perch you catch throughout the day is going to be on just a fathead minnow and a plain hook on a set line, be it a rattle reel, tip up, um, just a bobber and a minnow next to where you're jigging. A lot of times you're going to catch your biggest perch doing that. That's what you're going to get your biggest jumbo on. But most of your action is going to come on that little tungsten jig loaded up with spikes. That's what we have the most fun on. It's a good time fishing with that. The action's usually pretty quick with that little tungsten jig. Uh, gold, like I said, is one of my favorites. The other color that I like is glow. You can also use fire tiger. Any one of those three colors, those, those are going to be the go-tos. And those are going to work equally as well for the tulipy. Now, the one exception to the tulipy fishing that I use specifically for tulipy and not really anything else is the flasher rig. And the flasher rig is basically a spoon, kind of a heavier spoon that helps you get down 
with just a, a drop chain or a drop line of just a little bit of leader material and a small hook. Tula bee have little itty bitty mouths, teeny tiny little mouths. So they can't get a very big jig in their mouth. They definitely aren't gonna get a spoon in their mouth very easily. So you want that little dropper chain. The spoon helps bring the bait down to them. Um, on that dropper chain with that plain hook, you're just loading it up with bugs, be it spikes. You can use wax worms. I really like spikes because they stay on the hook better. But that spoon's gonna help your bait get down there. I typically go with silver. There's something about silver that's really attractive to Tulabee. I don't know if they uh, see the flash and it just uh, is an indicator to them that there might be other Tulabee around feeding. I'm not sure what it is, but the flash of that spoon draws them in. They see the little ball of bugs below it and that's what they go for. That little dropper spoon, that little flasher rig is on certain days just the ticket for getting Tulabee. And sometimes that little rig is going to provide the best fastest action for tulabee late in the season. The areas that I'm fishing perch in tulabee at this time are almost identical to where I was fishing them midwinter. The deepest water around the mud flats that I can find. You know, some of these mud flats, the deep water around them is 28 feet of water. Some of the other ones, the deep water around them is 37 feet of water. The ones with 37 feet of water are typically gonna be better than the ones with 28 feet of water. The deeper water flats seem to have the most consistent action. So that's where I look. Instead of going so much to points like I do for the walleyes on the flats, what I really like to look for when it comes to the perch and the tulabi is just hard edges, not necessarily points, but like the corner of the flat where you have a nice, hard, defined edge off of this corner into deeper water. That just seems to be some of the better areas for me. It's not to say that the points won't hold them. Sometimes that's where they want to be. But a nice corner, it doesn't necessarily have to be an extending, tapering point, just where that deeper water joins up to that shallow water flat. That seems to be the spots where I do the best late ice. So just a quick little recap on the four main seasons. You know, you have first ice, which is walking ice. It's kind of a November, early December thing. You're going for big pike in the bays. Next, you have early ice. This is the best time of year for walleyes. This is when you have the most action, a lot of times the biggest fish. It's just a really good time to be walleye fishing. Early ice is when you start making your way out into the main lake. It's a December deal. That's when guys are getting out on wheelers, snowmobiles, side-by-sides, that sort of thing. They're getting out to the mud flats, the rock piles. They're getting out to the gravel bars. They're getting out where they want with their toys. Next is midwinter. Midwinter is more of a January, February thing. That's when guys are driving out in their big trucks and they're towing their fish houses and they're making their way out into the middle of the lake. That's the busiest time of year out here. That's when you see all the commotion. That's when you'll notice that pressure really starts to affect things on this lake. So when you see those big crowds, when you see all that commotion, go the other direction, find a spot nearby, but don't go right into the middle of the crowds. It's just not gonna pan out. Lastly is late ice, and late ice is going to be a March and April deal. And late ice, I would say the big defining time for late ice is when you see that initial big thaw. Sometimes that'll happen late February, sometimes that happens into March, but that initial thaw where you start getting better light penetration under the ice, that is kind of, as weather goes, what I define as late ice. That's the beginning of late ice. During that late ice period, that's one of the best times to be out here for perch. It's one of the best times to be out here for tulabee. So I hope these tips help get you pointed in the right direction. I think I included everything that was important in there. I'll have more stuff like this coming out that'll be a little more specific to the seasons. But uh, good luck fishing and have a great season.